Good afternoon, good evening, or good night from whatever you're joining us today. My name is Juan Alonso, and I'm a professor in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at Stanford University. And today I have the distinct pleasure of being the moderator for this Forum 360, where you'll be hearing about a series of new grand challenges for CFD from the leaders in our community who are making the magic happen. Next slide, please. In 2014, a group sponsored by NASA, led by Boeing and including members of industry and academia, created a landmark document that has been adopted by our CFD community as a blueprint for future developments. The Vision 2030 CFD document describes what we believe is necessary by 2030 in order to realize the ambitious goal of a pervasive use of numerical simulations in a variety of aerospace applications of interest. This document contained findings and recommendations in a variety of different areas, including the raising of fidelity of physical modeling to the level of scale resolving simulations with an emphasis on unsteady flows. It talked about quantifying and managing both the numerical errors and the uncertainties present in these simulations to eventually enable certification by analysis. Automating all the steps of the analysis process from geometry and mesh generation to handling the vast amounts of data produced and extracting useful information, and ensuring that aerospace does not miss out on the promises of exascale computing, despite the difficulties that leveraging such new heterogeneous platforms will entail. Of course, recognizing that CFD is not an island, the document also spoke about integrating CFD workflows seamlessly with other disciplines for both analysis and design. In order to focus our community's uh, efforts and to measure our progress, the IAA CFD Vision 2030 Integration Committee has created a series of four grand challenge problems that are being unveiled here today in this very Forum 360. Grand challenge number one in high lift aerodynamics. Grand challenge number two in full engine simulations. Grand challenge number three in hypersonic aerothermodynamics. And grand challenge number four in space access. Let me introduce them briefly to you, and at the same time, try to highlight some of the main challenges that will require significant effort and support to get us through the finish line. Our panelists, of course, will go into more detail during this session. Grand challenge number one focuses on a series of technical challenges that culminate with our ability to perform, in simulation only, an accurate representation of a generic fly vehicle performing a low-speed wind-up turn. For us to be able to reproduce such a maneuver, we must be able to do the following. First of all, we have to treat the necessary geometric details of a generic flight vehicle. Then we have to reproduce the full aerodynamics of the high lift configuration. We must also account for the aerostructural coupling that results in both static and dynamic phenomena. And we have to include the engine power effects and manage interactions with various other disciplines. The culmination of this grand challenge will lead to the accuracy we would observe in flight tests of the same vehicle and maneuver. Grand challenge number two focuses on the ability to perform sufficiently accurate full engine simulations with all component interactions accounted for in less than one week from beginning to end. Significant challenges to overcome include the improved modeling of the aerodynamics, aeromechanics, and aeroacoustics of the fans and compressors likely requiring scale resolving simulations. We also have to tackle full annuals modeling of the combustor with sprays, combustion, stability, radiation, and heat transfer. In addition, we need to do turbine simulations with all the details of cooling and secondary flow systems, as well as heat transfer. And we must integrate the component simulations into single unsteady simulations, including the entire circumference of the engine. In order to be successful with this grand challenge, we'll also have to commission relevant and open experiments that can serve as a yardstick to measure our improvements. Grand challenge number three, as you can see, focuses on the virtual prototyping of hypersonic vehicles, both gliders in the near term and air breathing in the longer term, with sufficient accuracy to replace significant amounts of experimentation and the need for unnecessary flight tests. These problems are characterized by the presence of a very broad range of scales from microseconds uh, for the fluid dynamics to seconds for the conjugate heat transfer and control decisions. And this does represent a factor of a million in time scale separation. They're also characterized by the need for more sophisticated and highly integrated physics at different levels of fidelity and couple aerothermal structural and control challenges of an unsteady nature. 
Finally, grand challenge number four focuses on CFD in the loop for Monte Carlo simulation of space vehicles. Given the difficulty of obtaining data for new launch vehicle designs, unprecedented levels of accuracy in CFD simulations will be needed. But we have to recognize that variabilities in the operating environment and uncertainties in the modeling abound. So we have to account for these in a disciplined way, possibly leading to exorbitant computational costs. This will require, in addition to efficient and scalable CFD and automated mesh generation and adaptation, the efficient coupling between CFD and flight simulation, a focus on tight coupling of the disciplines, and full leverage of HPC in order to enable these capabilities. So there you have them, four grand challenges designed to tackle many of the relevant bottlenecks that the Vision 2030 CFD document had articulated and also to hold us accountable over the next 10 to 20 years so that we can continue to push our simulations beyond the current state of the art. But more importantly, these are four grand challenges to ignite the imagination of a large number of aerospace engineers and students, numerical analysts, computer scientists, physical modelers, geometry and mesh experts, applied mathematicians, working side by side with experimental experts to raise our current capabilities to the next level. Let me say something about how we're going to run this panel. I will first introduce to you one by one our invited panelists who, who will expand on these introductory remarks with their own personal opinions based on years of expertise. Uh, after this first round of short presentations, we'll open the floor for questions uh, from the audience and engage to the entire community to better understand and improve upon the grand challenges as they currently stand. I, I have to remark that these grand challenges are work in progress, so your input is most definitely welcome. In the bottom right side of your screen, you'll see an option to join the chat. Uh, if you have gone into full screen mode, you can only see this option if you exit momentarily uh, from full screen. And, and there, you'll be able to add your questions and comments so you can add to the conversation. Uh, you'll also notice that there's going to be a brief pause between the individual remarks of each of the panelists. Uh, uh, this is done on purpose, and it's needed to do the technical transition. So do not sign off, but please stay with us uh, over those few seconds of transition between one speaker and the other. And lastly, this session is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing on this platform later this week. So let me introduce the five panelists that we have assembled today uh, that are hopefully going to provide some depth and some uh, interesting comments regarding these four grand challenges. Steve Wells is currently the Director of Flight Sciences for Boeing Commercial Airplanes. Prior to leading flight sciences, Steve served on two commercial uh, aircraft programs as chief project engineer, both the KC-46 and the PA. He was also chief project engineer in the 767 program. Uh, Steve has had a, a, a breadth of experiences with deep technical background, and he worked as a fellow CFD engineer early in his career. So his bachelor's and a master's degree in Aerostro from the University of Illinois and an MBA from the University of Washington. After Steve, we'll have Om Sharma, who is a senior technical fellow in aerodynamics and gas turbines at the United Technologies Now Raytheon Research Center. In 1998, the year I, I met Om, he became the director of the Modeling, Simulation, Analysis, and Computational Initiative, where he began to pursue his vision of full engine simulations. He has a bachelor's and a master's degree from IIT in Delhi and a PhD in mechanical engineering from Birmingham University in the UK. After him, we'll have Micah Howard, who is a principal member of the technical staff in the Aerosciences Department at Sandia National Laboratories. He completed his PhD in aerospace engineering from the University of Colorado at Boulder and is currently leading the SPARC project at Sandia, which is focused on research, development, and delivery of a credible exascale capable hypersonic reentry aerothermodynamics modeling simulation code that can run across the entire generation of future HBC systems. After Micah, we will have Ray Gomez. Uh, Ray started uh, work at NASA Johnson Space Center in 1985 after completing his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Rice University. He currently works in the JSC Engineering Directorate that serves as the Multipurpose Crew Vehicle Aerodynamics Technical Authority. He is also the co-lead for the Space Launch System Aerodynamics and is a space applications representative on NASA Aerosciences Testing Advisory Board. And last but not least, we'll have John Kavalowski, who is, uh, you know, uh, playing, uh, I guess, uh, twice today. He was uh, in one of the earlier panels, 
John is responsible for the overall planning, management, and evaluation of NASA ARMD's efforts to cultivate revolutionary concepts, tools, and technologies that enable aviation transformation. The TAC, or TAC program, encourages ideas, including new computational and experimental tools, and drives the conception of future concepts and first-of-a-kind capabilities. When I first met John at NASA headquarters, he was director of the Airspace Operations and Safety Program, enabling the development of revolutionary improvements to the national airspace system. John has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from MIT and master's and PhD degrees from the University of California at Berkeley. So we're going to transition to our, our first speaker, uh, first panelist, uh, Steve, you're up. Thank you very much, Juan, and, and thank you for having me here today. I really wish that we could do this in person, but it is truly amazing what we can do with the virtual technology. You know, the first time that I gave a talk at an AIAA convention, uh, I was a graduate student, and we did it with slides and overhead projectors. And if you look at the paradigm shift from that technology to what we're doing today, that's kind of what we're talking about with these grand challenges. It's all very doable, but we have to do the work to make it happen. Let's go to the next slide. So CFD has really become an essential tool in the development of aircraft. It has taken us from the place where we would have to test dozens of wings in the wind tunnel uh, down to just a handful. And really the reason that those handful of, of uh, iterations happen is because the whole configuration is iterating not because we got the prediction of the, of the characteristics wrong. But that is really in the center of the flight envelope, kind of denoted here by the hash marks in the middle. Uh, 1G, fairly steady state flows. And that's all good because that's where a commercial airplane spends most of its life. But the design is really tested and most of the certification work is done at the limits of the envelope. If you go to the right hand or the left hand side, uh, as we slow down, we have stalls, 1G and accelerated. Of course, on the other side, we have high speed buffet that we have to predict. And across the envelope, we have to predict the handling characteristics, both post stall and in dive recoveries. All of that stuff, all of those conditions are unsteady flows. We have to consider aeroelastic thrust effects, asymmetric, all of that has to get to the point where we have the same confidence at the limits of the envelope as we do in that hatched, shaded middle of the envelope. It's only once we do that, once we have the fidelity in the physics and the fidelity in the geometry, that we can really realize the full potential of model-based engineering development. Where we get to the point where we know the characteristics of the airplane before we the fir first part is ever built, where we can document our certification positions before we ever fly, ultimately, that's where we need to get, and that's what this grand challenge is about. Next sl slide, please. So the, the grand challenge really is, is a phased approach, increasing in complexity, starting off with uh, a very solid wind tunnel base and progressing into flight. The, the high lift common research model is an open source definition of a transport aircraft configuration that can be used by various wind tunnels and researchers to, to uh, create the database that we will need to develop and calibrate these CFD technologies. It will allow us to have uh, variations in Reynolds numbers wall effects, tear and interference uh, uh, situations, and ultimately progress the complexity of the geometry from a simple wing, wing body to high lift systems deployed empennage thrust effects, and even look at the effects of icing, which becomes increasingly critical in our development and certification process. 
So it's truly, and I love this word they use down here, it's truly an, an ecosystem uh, ver uh, various uh, research entities and researchers pulling this all together that will give us a very solid foundation to, uh, to hone the CFD capabilities. And while the, the CRM provides that solid capability, ultimately we're going to have to show that we can predict flight characteristics. Now, uh, again, we have a stepped approach. The first phase involves low speed straight ahead uh, stalls. We'll have to account for the unsteady character of that. We will have to uh, understand the response of the geometry, but it is a it is a stepping stone. Eventually, we get to full scale large aircraft, and this is one of the critical ones that that we find in in tuning a a flight vehicle is getting the proper wind up turn to a stall. So you have dynamic maneuvers. You have uh, aero elastics, you have aero server elastics, you have thrust effects, all of that stuff has to be properly modeled. And of course, that will push because of the complexity, our computing infrastructure, how we integrate various disciplines together, how we model these and the algorithms that go with it. Let's progress to the next slide. So again, achieving this grand challenge will take a broad community working together. Uh, as I mentioned, infrastructure. As the models get larger and more complex, the computing infrastructure will have to adapt. We'll have to go from petascale to exascale computing. We're going to have to not just look at the computation itself, but enormous databases will be generated from this. So storage access, being able to uh, pull it out for analysis and visualization, all the tools are going to have to scale with, with that work. Geometry and grids are no longer static inputs to the calculation. They must adapt, refine, deflect as the solution converges. And at this point, we already know that RAND's methodologies will not get us to the corner of the envelope, but we don't yet know exactly what we need to get there. Do we need wall modeled LES? Do we need to resolve the wall? Do we need to go to DNS? Where those boundaries are, we have to discover we don't want to uh, apply an overly complex uh, methodology to the solution, but we'll have to explore what is necessary to get there. And ultimately at some point, uh, CFD will no longer represent really what we are doing. It will no longer be fluid dynamics anymore. It will be coupled fluid structural and system dynamics. And at some point, we're going to have to start calling it uh, computational air aircraft simulation because that will be a much uh, clearer description of what we are really doing here. As we go through this, it's only really through that full simulation of the entire vehicle that we will be able to achieve the promise of model-based engineering development and ultimately certification by analysis. That's the goal we need to get to. And just like I said, the, the motion from uh, using slides on an overhead projector to doing this sort of webinar, it's technology evolution. We can get there, but that's what we need to go work on. And so at this point, uh, I would like to introduce the next presenter. Uh, Om Sharma will be our next presenter. So thank you very much. All set? Yes, you can start when you're ready. Right. Uh, good afternoon. It is a pleasure to be at this meeting and be a member of the panel. Like uh, in 1984, I gave a presentation in the AIAA meeting at Seattle, and the presentation represented unsteady flow through a turbine where we had acquired a large body of data. And the data, when we looked at it, it clearly showed that the flow in you know, turbo machinery and turbines is highly unsteady. At that time, we did not have any unsteady codes. We started using CFD 
three-dimensional boiler codes to design airfoil rows. Uh, it initiated a program that started to look at the unsteady flow uh, through turbines. Manmohan Rai at NASA uh, worked on that decode first. Then after that, over a period of 15 years, I worked on a number of uh, programs at Pratt & Whitney, uh, developing, getting involved in the, en in the engine uh, development programs. And it became very clear that we had a lot of problems when we were trying to build the engine based on a component, a, you know, just component each at a time, developing the components. When we put them together, we got surprised. So in 1997, 1998, we requested uh, Bill Reynolds at Stanford University to look at the uh, program to look to do full engine simulation. And I think Juan was a part of that meeting or part of that program and a number of other people. So I've been kind of in this business since 1998. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, Juan explained uh, the uh, grand challenge problem for the propulsion in, in this figure. It's kind of a rather complicated look, looking figure. But if you go from bottom to the top on each arrow, you see the simulation of, or we are looking at a component like a turbine, go from single stage aerodynamics and aeromechanics, single stage heat transfer, multi stage and multi stage heat transfer. So go from a simple model for a turbine as it exists now to add complexity and to add higher fidelity and physics. Uh, similar thing, we do it for the combustor and for the uh, compressor and the fan. In principle, uh, in 2007 or 2008, after the program at Stanford University was completed, by at that time, I, uh, Bill Reynolds had passed away, and we had Juan and uh, Parvez Moin. Uh, they put together, they completed the program, 10 years program, and they produced a uh, code that could do full engine simulation for that could do a full engine simulation. Uh, this was the first time it was done. Now, that simulation, first simulation that was done, was really by utilizing about 15 million grid points. Impressive calculation, a lot of, lot of physics was highlighted in that program. What we need to do is really improve the fidelity of these. Uh, of, of these codes and improve the resolution. Same uh, program or same simulation if you wanted to do today, probably we could do that with about one and a half billion grid points. Still not sufficient to resolve all the features of the flow field. And our goal is really to, to, to try to go to about maybe about 100 billion grid point calculations uh, towards the end of this program. I think. Uh, benefit, there's a tremendous amount of benefits that will come out of this program. It will affect both the performance, durability, and operability of the engine. Can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, if I say since 2007, the progress made, you know, since uh, ASCII simulations, we can do a calculation 20x final grid. 1.5 billion uh, computational cells. In about two, two weeks, we can do that calculation. Full wheel calculation for whole of the engine, again, we could do it in two weeks with about 15 billion uh, grid points. We've started exploring more physics, large AD simulations for turbines and localized area in compressor as well as combustor. More detailed cooling in the turbine and combustor areas. We are accounting for the boundary conditions more accurately. Previous calculations have been done by using adiabatic wall conditions and fuel spray uh, atomization. Now, this calculation, although I'm saying it can be done, but I haven't seen any publication or presentation since 2007, last presentation that was made by the Stanford group. Can you click it, please? What are the issues now? Based on the, if you look at the roadmap, 
it's hard to tra- track the progress on individual elements based on the existing CFD vision in the roadmap. Biggest problem is funding is scarce and intermittent, and com- computational resources are still limited. Uh, in this area, we really need leadership from the government to provide resources like they did uh, by NASA in early this, uh, 1970s and early 2000s by doing the energy efficient engine program, which was which forms the basis of all the engines, aircraft engines that are flying today in large aircraft. Can you go to the next slide, please? My opinion, if you say, what's the design, execution, and importance of this grand challenge effort? So this effort, we could enhance the design if we had an ability to demonstrate what will it take to do full engine simulation. And I think we should have a periodic review of those, uh, of those capabilities. Execution of the, thought, uh, of the tasks can be enhanced. Currently, it's being done with limited resources. And I think we, again, need funding agencies to provide leadership to accelerate the program. Program is very important. It has potential to provide 10 to 15% cradle to grave cost savings for the propulsion system, both for the new and the current aircrafts. Effective ways to engage the science and engineering community. I, again, you know, what, what's needed is people are interested in these tasks, identify funding uh, in strategic areas, and monitor the progress in annual AAA meetings. The team has done an outstanding job in, in completing this, uh, putting together the roadmap. But the collaboration between the university, industry, and the research center is needed to successfully achieve it. And it is very important because, uh, again, it affects both the performance, operability, and cost of ownership of the engine. Thank you. Now I would uh, introduce the next speaker. Mika Howard is going to uh, talk about the hypersonics grand challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Om. I'll be speaking to the hypersonics grand challenge problem and giving you some further depth on that and also giving you a perspective both on how we at Sandia are approaching the challenges of hypersonic CFD and also how we in the DOE and at NSA are pushing the bounds of hypersonic CFD into the exascale computing era. Uh, I, I appreciate Steve Wells' comment on the huge shift in technology for giving presentations between his early days participating in AAA meetings and today, and I think in the hypersonic space, we're at a similarly early phase in the technology, similar to uh, projectors uh, from decades ago. And I think it's an exciting thing to think about what the technology could look like 10 10 to 20 years from now, and what we can do to shape that technology today and in the coming years. Next slide, please. As Juan mentioned in his intro to the GC problems, the hypersonic GC is broken down into two categories or classes of vehicles, boost glide systems and air breathing systems. For both, the GC is about predicting the performance of these systems through their normal operational envelope and more challenging off nominal conditions. Both of these have their unique characteristics such as ablation and thermal response for boost glide systems as well as combustion kinetics for air breathing systems. But I wanna focus on the phenomena that they have in common and what they share. Both have challenges in boundary layer transition and turbulent boundary layers. Both involve complex, unsteady flows. Both have challenges associated with shock boundary layer interaction. And all three of these areas are very difficult to us for us to predict currently and really define the grand challenges as we've laid it out. The, hy- the phenomena associated with these systems present significant challenges for our CFD methods. As Juan mentioned, there's a large range of spatial and temporal scales, which significantly stress our CFD algorithms for hypersonic simulation. They're inherently multi-physics with many underlying models. Discretization accuracy and robustness is heavily stressed. 
when trying to numerically simulate these systems. And it's difficult to obtain high quality validation data for computational methods and models, even in the best circumstances. Um, some of the best data that we can get out of a flight test really still leaves holes in our validation processes. Um, and to be frank, we just don't flight, the, flight test these systems as often as, as other aerospace systems. Um, they're expensive and difficult to test. And certainly the US is starting to take on more flight testing in this space. Um, but it really puts a lot of emphasis on ground test and for CFD. Next slide, please. These challenges posed, um, these are the challenges posed by the hypersonics and, and CFD um, in the context of this stated grand challenge problem. Now I'd like to turn your attention to where ISS we are, at least in the hypersonics community, in relation to the CFD 2030 vision and what it will take to get us to where we want to be, where we'd like to be in the next decade. On the HPC front, the highest end machines in the US are getting more complex and our readiness, at least in our CFD codes for these machines is lacking. Effectively utilizing these machines by 2030 will take a pretty significant effort, in my opinion, within the community at best. And um, we really need a coordinated effort here to pull that off. Uh, physical, physical modeling, I, I feel like we've made a lot of progress in terms of wall modeled LES, scale resolving simulations. And, and I think that's something that we have to stand on looking forward to the future. And I feel that um, modeling hypersonic boundary layer transition is still an area of great need in terms of physical modeling. In terms of algorithms, um, work in the context of hypersonics is, is right for advances. We've seen a lot of progress in high order discretizations uh, for other application areas. And I'd like to see that carry through and, and be tested out and proven in the hypersonic space. And I do feel that there's a need for scale, algorithmically scalable solvers in hypersonic CFD. Uh, geometry and mesh generation is an area where we've been investing at least to some degree at Sandia. Personally, I feel confident about our ability uh, to generate and use grids on the order of tens of billions of cells. Um, we have a very niche approach to doing this and making large scale mesh generation generally applicable and regularly practiced is gonna be a challenge in the next decade. Knowledge extraction, at least from a DOE perspective, I feel like we've made pretty great strides in UQ methodologies and workflows for hypersonics, especially on large scale machines. Um, and also in in-situ vis and data analysis, I feel like we've, we've pushed pretty far on this. And last and, la and not least, multidisciplinary analysis and optimization. I feel like we, the hypersonics community, have a really good path regarding multidisciplinary analysis and a long way to go regarding multidisciplinary optimization. Um, especially UQ enabled optimization. Uh, we have a lot of work to do here, especially considering the simulation of an entire flight body. Next slide, please. So as somebody that works uh, within the DOE and who also works in the space of hypersonic CFD, a perspective I have to offer is on the intersection of US leadership class computing and hypersonics. We at Sandia have been on a path to bring hypersonic CFD into the exascale era for at least five years and will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. The journey for us began when the NSCI was enacted in the summer of 2015 under the Obama administration. This led to the creation of the Exascale Computing Project, which many of you know about, which is a whole of government effort to field the nation's first exascale machines for the DOE, Office of Science, and the NNSA laboratories. And importantly as well, to field codes that are capable of effectively and efficiently utilizing these next generation computing architectures that are in these machines and, and proposed machines. The NSEI gave rise um, to uh, the Spark project here at Sandia, which is a hypersonic CFD code geared towards performance portable utilization of the NNSA supercomputers like Lawrence Livermore's Sierra machine, which you see on the screen. This is based on NVIDIA V100 GPUs and Sandia's Astra computer, which is based on Cavium ARM CPUs. So very different architectures than what we're used to, at least for the past couple decades with x86 processor technology. This code project, Spark at, at Sandia, has been preparing for use of NNSA's first exascale system, which is Livermore's uh, El Capitan, which should hit the floor in the 2023 timeframe and will be a heterogeneous CPU GPU system very similar to Livermore's current Sierra system and based on um, HP and AMD technology. A perspective I'd like to share is one of the pacing items, at least for us within the DOE, 
uh, towards towards reaching our goals. And, and that has been adapting to a changing and increasingly diverse HPC landscape. Handling heterogeneity and more complex node architectures, at least in terms of the execution spaces and the memory spaces comprised in these devices, has been a challenge. It's led us to invest in the problem of what we call performance portability, that is having a single code base, code base that can um, wisely use the underlying node architectures. And here we recognize the cost of, of writing a code for um, any single system and any single programming model is, is quite costly. And we want to be able to port that performance across machines without having to rewrite our codes significantly. Achieving the CFD 2030 vision in the Exascale era, I believe, will be a, a pretty big challenge for the hypersonics community at large. And I think um, we've made some steps, at least within the DOE labs, and charted a course in terms of software technologies that I, I think can and should and hope will be used by the hypersonics community to reach um, this vision and to achieve uh, what we set out for with this grand challenge problem. Next slide, please. Okay, so bringing this all together now, we within NNSA and at Sandia have a vision for hypersonic CFD in the exascale era. While we've been on an independent path from CFD 2030, it coincidentally aligns quite closely with CFD 2030 and the new grand challenge problem for hypersonics that we've proposed here today. Uh, one of the technology demonstrations on the CFD 2030 roadmap, the original roadmap, was for, um, by the 2030 timeframe, for an UQ-enabled multidisciplinary analysis and optimization of a full aircraft. And we envision doing something very similar, conducting a virtual flight test of a full flight body with the ability to quantify the uncertainties of our numerical prediction. This necessarily involves being able to do this. We, we have to be able to scale our performance on US leadership class HPCs, improve the degree of predictivity of hypersonic boundary layer transition and compressible turbulence, focus on gas phase, gas surface, non-equilibrium chemistry. It's very important in, these, in this application space. Consider whole body structural forcing. This is something we don't typically do today, at least amongst practitioners in the community, and whole body ablation and thermal response of the flight body. And last of all, having the credibility processes such that if we have this virtual flight test capability, that we have confidence that we can believe the results from a virtual flight test. So in closing, uh, I believe this is all underpinned by the technology areas outlined in the original CFD 2030 roadmap. Personally, in the hypersonics community, I think we can only pull this off if we pull together like we haven't before. And I think a grand challenge uh, type problem is a, great, is a great way to focus our efforts um, and galvanize us as a community to achieve that. Um, so that's all I have prepared, and I'd like to now pass it off to Ray Gomez. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Micah, and uh, thanks to the IAA for this opportunity to participate in this forum. The, uh, the last few years have been a really exciting time for space access. We haven't launched a lot of vehicles, but there are multiple new launch vehicles being designed and developed, along with an unprecedented number of new spacecraft and entry vehicles. And uh, recently, we saw two NASA astronauts uh, launch the International Space Station on the SpaceX Crew Dragon. So there's some uh, exciting things moving forward, some milestones that we've established. Um, also, I've heard from multiple universities um, that they're, hearing, they're seeing increased interest in aerospace engineering. And I think that these new vehicles and some of these other subjects that other panels have been discussing are probably part of that growing interest. And uh, you know, fortunately for these students, there's still a number of uh, very challenging problems associated with space access, access. And I'm going to try and talk about some of them. Um, to get to orbit, we have to go from essentially Mach 0 to Mach 25, from incompressible to verified hypersonic flows. And that comes to such a broad range that there's a, a lot of different things we need to, to look at, a lot of different challenges, and any one of these could be a grand challenge. Things from um, wind-induced oscillation, when we're uh, sitting on the pad and the vehicle can oscillate and cause structural problems, or could be ignition overpressure when the engines ignite and there's a large pressure transient that comes up and affects the, the structure. We talk about propulsion, turbo pumps, and modeling solid rockets is a very challenging problem. Um, maximum dynamic pressure when we have high acoustics and buffet loads along with the peak loads on the vehicle is, a, is always the challenge for us. Um, 
staging, booster separation, fairing separation. We've got multibody dynamics there. That's a challenge for us. And then we get to on-orbit proximity operations where we got plumes firing, turning, going from continuum to rarefied, and, and um, loading up the International Space Station solar arrays. And then we need to come back. So we have entry, and we're starting out, you know, we go through non-equilibrium reacting flows in the hypersonic uh, uh, flight regime. And some of these capsules now have a blader, so we've got more complex chemistry. And we've got shape change going on as a function of time. Um, so designing a capsule that's stable from hypersonic to subsonic flows is very challenging. And, you know, I'll talk about that more in this, this grand challenge. And then finally, we transition down to parachutes for some other landing system. So any of these could, like I said, could be a grand challenge, but I want to focus on the last part of entry where we're going from supersonic to transonic to subsonic. And I'll talk about that on this, uh, this slide here. Now, as uh, Micah mentioned, uh, you know, flight testing is an extremely sparse thing. You know, we've got uh, AA2 over there on the right. We recently had it. It's an ascent abort test number two. And that is our only planned flight test where we have a transonic separation to really try and drive our separation systems and exercise all the systems together. And that really does give us enough data to have statistical information into our uncertainties. Now, it's very valuable as a validation source, but we need more data than that. So typically what the space community does is we rely on Monte Carlo flight simulation to, uh, to perform this sort of statistical analysis and determine our margins and, uh, and, uh, and our, from structural margins to uh, uh, stability margins, et cetera. Now, one of the inputs to that is the aerodynamic databases. And we can take years to develop them using wind tunnel tests, CFD, empirical data, and engineering judgment. Um, we may need hundreds of solutions to characterize the ascent. A separation event may need thousands, even tens of thousands of simulations. And these are fairly large, complex vehicles with nonlinear uh, controls and uh, jets and cross flow that are affecting the flow field. Uh, aborts may require even more because an abort can occur with a wide range of different conditions. And now in our current systems involves a number of plumes that can be fired in, in, uh, in sequences that can involve a very large parameter space. And the, uh, basically these, these wide range of parameters is one of the biggest problems we face. But the thing I wanna focus on here is, is the, on the lower right. And that's an example of a hypersonic entry vehicle. It's six off couple CFT. This particular simulation was done by our external NASA Ames. And what we'd ideally like to do is have in a flight simulator that's directly coupled to CFD or a flight simulator that can do this Monte Carlo analysis for us. And that would be a game changer as far as design and development of these vehicles goes. Now I realize that we are orders of magnitude away from the capability to, to simulate the entire flight envelope of the vehicle. But as we're going from supersonic to, to transonic and subsonic, the vehicle um, can get induced, we can induce certain perturbations in it that will have uh, give us some dynamic stability issues. We can predict the supersonic portion of it pretty well. The supersonic flow tends to um, um, result in a smaller wake and it's a more controllable vehicle in that flow regime. But as the uh, weight grows and the flow becomes more complex, we actually get more viscous dominated flow on the back end of the vehicle. And then subsonic, it's even more challenging. Our ability to predict that is degraded. And when we test it, we typically can only test it in uh, one degree of freedom. We can either pitch or yaw around an axis. And what we see in flight is that these vehicles have a more complex uh, motion where they can process and rotate. In order to control that, we've got reaction control system jets, which are on the aft part of the vehicle. And these are nonlinear control effectors. Currently, we're driving that with a um, flow, flow fields that are, are essentially steady state. We've got static databases. What we really would like to do is couple it. So NASA is working to take um, trajectory simulation codes and couple them to CFD codes so that we can uh, do the simulation without some of the assumptions we've had before. But in order to do this in an effective manner, we're going to require computationally efficient CFD, and we're going to have to be able to automatically uh, generate these robust, these systems in a fairly amount, short amount of time. So we're going to need a lot of uh, code optimization there. We're going to need a lot of reliability because these are complex simulations. We're not going to be able to sit there and, and babysit them as they go. Um, so um, there are also some physical modeling challenges we'll have to address. And uh, you know, we, um, we have several efforts on, going on this front, and uh, we have a number of other challenges waiting for us after we get past this. So uh, with that, I think I'd like to turn it over to our final speaker, uh, John Kabalowski.
Thanks, Ray. Um, appreciate the opportunity to, to be on this panel with you all. Um, and wrapping it up, actually, as uh, after me, we're going to uh, we'll be a stimulating Q and A section uh, to address so much of the um, the breadth of the discussion that was presented by uh, the previous four, four speakers here. Um, I've got a few remarks, uh, uh, three charts, but uh, they will be uh, addressed at a reasonably high level. I'm trying to give a broader NASA perspective, at least NASA aeronautics perspective. Ray was addressing. Yeah, other areas of, of, of interest across the, the full NASA portfolio. Um, but there's quite a bit of work that's going on. It's not all in the program that I oversee. Um, so I'm going to do my best to, to cover it uh, at, a, uh, at a reasonable introductory level. Um, but it, it has been pretty clear in, in listening to all of these presentations and, and Juan's address of, our, um, uh, of this space that we are evaluating today that um, there's a tremendous amount of work going on across those five major objectives laid out in the earliest stages of our CFD 2030 vision study. Uh, the grand challenge are help allowing us to focus that, um, but you know, the integration across these range of challenges you know, whereby we're, we're dealing with, with new physics, uncertainty quantification, uh, elements of, of automation, exascale computing, as well as large-scale uh, multidisciplinary optimization and, and analysis, that there's a, a lot of work that we still need to do across these broad domains. And I think that we've got an opportunity to address uh, a bit of that uh, in, in the NASA work that I'll be spending a little bit of time to talk about. So we go to the next chart, please. So again, as introduced up front, the CFD 2030 vision study upon which we're building so much of this work, so much of this collaboration and these challenges, is something that we had uh, sponsored out of NASA, out of my organization, my particular program organization, uh, delivered back in 2014. Um, again, this view of providing long-term actionable research plan for the community um, uh, around the development, the need of development of computational capability and technology overall has been extremely valuable. Um, and in part, what it has allowed us to do is identify, as we're speaking today, these key grand challenges. And they're, they're critical, certainly, to aerospace industry. They're critical to university support and challenges. They're critical to government. Uh, but it, what it, I mean, identifying those component problems that help us focus our investment. Um, as much as these are uh, there's tremendous effort that's going on in each of the organizations that you've heard from today, um, part of the, the biggest problem is that there's no one organization uh, here in the U.S. or even for, in the globe, for that matter, that has the ability to attack all of these problems in a fully integrated manner. We need this coordinated community address and community response in order to enable the kind of progress that we need. Uh, to, to make good on this 2030 target, which year by year keeps getting closer and the challenges are, you know, still remain large and the gaps and the barriers still remain large. Um, so one of the things that we are working to make sure that we deliver um, is opportunities to, to provide these non-proprietary but relevant configurations. Uh, data, we heard the, the shortage a uh, paucity of data in a variety of these challenge areas that we can use for code validation uh, and to improve our capability to do these, these detailed analyses, integrated analysis. Uh, we're trying to make sure that through the use of common research models we are, and the access to our test facilities, wind tunnels in particular, and, as well as flight assets, trying to generate the validation experiments and the data that allows us to assess the computational capability that we're working to improve by means of our, our uh, in intense CFD and, and physics-based approaches. Um, again, this is very much in keeping with the, the vision recommendations. Um, and you know, one of the challenges that we're working on is trying to identify uh, you know, funding not just for our, our support of the, the CFD development, but these experiments that are so critical to validating that. And certainly, uh, Having the, the common research models, having the validation experiments, allowing us to validate the code is, is, is wonderful. But the, the tremendous value of coming together through community workshops, much of which you know, sponsored by 
AIAA um, is allowing the kind of rapid learning, the kinds of collaboration, the kind of ad, the, the joint address of gaps and barriers that is essential to making the progress that we know we need in, in this area for the, uh, the 2030 vision. And, you know, the, Nat, the uh, excuse me, CFD 2030 Integration Committee here with AAA, um, you know, sponsoring this forum nonetheless is just a, a welcome uh, outgrowth of this particular uh, study. And, uh, you know, we look forward to seeing more of this as, as we go forward. Uh, next chart, please. So in terms of some of the specific work that, that we've been uniquely taking on, or at least uniquely sponsoring, Although, as you'll hear in a moment, uh, we are doing not in isolation, but uh, testing with a number of different organizations, is, is building these uh, validation experiments and engaging in these workshops. So even pre uh, the 2030 study document or the vision document, uh, drag prediction workshops with the common research model we built back and, and began testing back in the uh, uh, in 2010 and in the earlier 2000s has been a critical element uh, of work and support that we, we brought to the community. Um, they're working with JAXA as an example, uh, and a forum partner to help us do across facilities and tunnels, um, get the kind of validation that was critical to, to driving this forward. It also led to an outgrowth for, uh, for another uh, key you know, physics challenge of, of juncture flow uh, that allowed us to take a, a new approach to uh, addressing a, a different common research model with some unique uh, experimental capability that you see in the, the middle right of this document, uh, doing the, the laser-based optical non-intrusive diagnostics for the uh, for evaluation of, um, of, of flow and, um, uh, and, and pressures at, uh, at the juncture flow region of, this, of vehicles. This is going to become more and more important as we look at a variety of configurations, truss brace wing and, and others that uh, are being considered for their, their efficiency and their, their flight productivity. But uh, we need these sort of critical experiments to, to run these uh, to, to ground in terms of our ability to, um, to validate the code in those areas and, and get the efficiency out of flight testing of these and, and flight certification. And then as we look down the bottom, there's another thread that we've been running of late, uh, and Ken, this is building off of some of Steve Wells' earlier comments, uh, the, the first presenter here tonight, the high left prediction workshops. Again, we've been addressing the challenges in that area going back before CFD 2030, but there's been a much stronger focus uh, since the study came out uh, with a variety of, of high lift CRM model experiments that we conducted in the, uh, the mid-2000s. And, and going forward into the, the early 2020s, uh, where we're taking advantage of, of NASA capabilities, 14 by 22 and the NTF facility, but also the kinetic uh, tunnel over in the UK that's allowing us to get a variety of, of validated uh, collaborative uh, you know, data sets that are, that are so critical to the work that we're doing. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that we've been working with our, our OEMs here, especially with regards to what these codes are truly going to allow us to do. And it's, it's around a certification by analysis approach. I mean, certainly in terms of design, uh, in places where it's, it's very difficult to get data, uh, it becomes even you know, more important for us to take advantage of those flight uh, capabilities and, the, um, and uh, the experimental points that we can reach with uh, uh, with our subsonic wind tunnels uh, in our facilities to be able to uh, do the right measurements and validate the codes such that we can improve the way we do the certification testing. Um, you know, in talking with, uh, with you know, some of our OEMs, it is clear that if there's a new con vehicle configuration, um, it can take up to $2 billion or so just to provide uh, the, the flight testing that is critical. For, uh, for certification. Uh, if we are able to reduce those by means of addressing some of the high lift regions, and in fact, again, as, as Steve was mentioning, um, the, the, the majority of the flight test time for certification that's conducting uh, is addressing those high lift areas. It's about a third of the total points uh, that need to be flown for, for FAA certification. 
if what we are able to do is reduce those, even half of those, I mean, there are hundreds of millions of dollars of savings and time that is so critical to being able to, to certify flight assets you know, for new configurations and bring them to market that much faster. So all of this is leading to the, you know, the improvement in, in codes that is addressing real value in terms of our, um, our opportunity to, to drive costs down and even more importantly, drive time to market down that is so important. Uh, again, doing these by means of um, our collaboration across multiple partners, uh, the locally, uh, industry partners, and our, um, our, our partners overseas that, that are so you know, important in doing this effectively. Uh, next chart, please, and final chart. So uh, potential future activities that build on this same approach that we've been taking. Um, Aeroelastic Prediction Workshop Series, again, started you know, going back now close to a, a, a decade, but trying to build off of a, additional needs that have been identified to the uh, 2030 vision document. That uh, is a very uh, important element of the work that, that we see necessary going forward. Again, we were listening to, to Steve and others uh, you know, bring up the aeroelastic challenges of some of these new configurations that are so important to address. Um, dealing with uh, you know, a, a new uh, validation experiment uh, is part of the contribution that we are uh, looking to make with this, uh, building uh, a uh, optical measurement capability uh, to address some of these physics challenges uh, in the Langley TDT. Um, you know, and again, that, that critical you know, CRM that we will be uh, addressing for the you know, wind tunnel model that can take advantage of these new diagnostic techniques and bring uh, you know, critical data to these prediction workshop series. We certainly see that we want to be extending uh, our work towards greater va uh, validation experiments that support the propulsion grant challenge. Um, we're you know, considering uh, a start with some new uh, component level approach, and hopefully some of the feedback that we can get out of this 360 that can provide us some input that allow us to design that and provide some level of investment as we go forward. But also, uh, in, in general, the aero, propulsion, hypersonic, and space grand challenge problems are all inherently multidisciplinary. And so developing the right discipline components, but also those MDAO tools that are necessary to address these across multiple levels of fidelity for you know, configuration assessment and trade space work to the more detailed design and validation are all things that are critical. Shock, shock interaction, shock boundary related interaction, hypersonic transition, and the air breathing uh, combustion challenges in hypersonics are all great examples of that, that again, stretch across not just you know, the space challenge, the hypersonic challenge, but certainly enter uh, elements of our uh, higher speed propulsion and aero uh, challenges as well. Again, this is an entire community that we need to bring together across this government industry and academia. And I, th I think that the approach that we've been taking here, that the 2030 study and the AIAA uh, workshops and uh, and planning efforts that have been gone on uh, that have gone on over the last number of years has been not only a logical, but very beneficial way to make progress towards this vision. So uh, again, just a, a quick few comments. So uh, let me um, first thank you for, for listening, but turn this back to Juan um, and we'll bring this to a, a Q&A and look forward to engaging the, uh, the community more so in, um, in any questions that have come up. So thank you very much. Okay, well, welcome back, everybody. Thank you to all the panelists for those wonderful presentations to just get us going. I, I have to tell you, I wish we were all here in person in Reno or whatever the conference might be uh, so we could see each other and we could see the audience and interact with it. But let's make it as interactive as possible within the uh, framework that we're providing. So, so please, as we go across uh, many of the questions that are being submitted online, and please continue to do so if you don't mind. Uh, if you have something to add, just please interrupt. So 
So let's get to the most interesting part of the panel. This is a little bit like uh, being a, a kid in a candy store in some senses uh, with mm -hmm. so many things to discuss. So, uh, let me start uh, with Steve, if you don't mind, Steve. Uh, mm -hmm. I think in, in the context of the Vision 2030 CFD that we're discussing here today, and since you brought this up in your remarks, and I also alluded to them myself, what are your thoughts on the evolution of computations and experimentation or experimental capabilities uh, for aircraft design and certification over the next 20 years? What What is the role that is going to be played by each one of those components uh, before we realize this full vision of doing simulations mostly alone? Yeah, I mean, I, the fir first thing is experimentation is not going away. I guarantee you that, right? I, I started my career doing uh, experimental wind tunnel testing as well. Um, but they're going to evolve together, right? They, and they have to. Absolutely. Um, it, you know, when you look at it, you, we, we, we've outlined what we're talking about for CFD, and it needs that experimental database, uh, and it needs, you know, revised measure or improved measurement techniques to look at off-body flows to understand whether or not we're resolving flows correctly. We've got to work on, you know, uh, I mentioned wall corrections, tear and interference. How do we get to the point where we can deal with the nonlinear nature of those corrections as we get to the extreme to the flight envelope. So I think there's a there's an evolution that has to go, and I think it will be cyclical. In other words, the experimentation will inform the CFD, and the CFD will inform the experimentation. Now, ultimately, as we go forward, um, wind tunnels are amazingly efficient integrators of databases, the huge aerodynamic database that we need uh, in order to put together simulators or other things. And so, uh, they will play a role and it will be a different role. Again, I think informed by the CFD as you apply those corrections um, and flight test as well. Again, uh, the goal is to move flight test into that validation of the model, but it will never go away. We will have to prove that the flight vehicle does what we say it's going to do. So I think they'll move together. That, that makes perfect sense to me. And again, I'll, I'll encourage any of the panelists if they want to add on to any particular answer to just jump on. But uh, l let me turn to Micah. Micah, th there have been a number of questions from the audience uh, uh, regarding you know, the role of DOE, et cetera, et cetera. But let me ask you the following, since you, you come from one of the national labs and you're very familiar with HPC and the trends towards exascale computing, uh, how do you think we will use HPC and XSL computing to accomplish the goals of the third grand challenge, the one that's related to hypersonics? Uh, you know, how, how do you envision the future computing architectures that will be useful for that grand challenge? Yep. Okay. So I, I think um, exascale computing and, and personal opinion here um, is really the only means by which we'll accomplish the goals of the of grand challenge three, the hypersonics grand challenge. I think the challenges are just too great in terms of the physical phenomena that we need to understand and simulate um, to do it alone and without um, the forefront of, of high performance computing in this country. And I think this is a position that many of us in the CFD community are comfortable with and familiar with. CFD practitioners for forever have, have really been working at the forefront of HPC capabilities. Um, so I, I think, um, Exascale machines and these new architectures will be used in two ways for this grand challenge problem. One is to push further in scale resolving simulations. And here I'm, I'm talking about DNS and wall resolved LES. I, I think that we will do this no matter what. Um, and, and we'll use the insights gained to create new models, uh, better models, or hone existing models. And the second area is to buy down uncertainty in our approaches for designing and analyzing full system vehicles by increasing geometric fidelity, by reducing limiting assumptions that we that we have today in our in our CFD methodologies, and upping the model fidelity. Um, now, in terms of the architectures themselves, I think we've got a really big challenge. So I've stated I think this can only be accomplished through exascale working by our working with us and, and as a tool to our advantage. Um, but the road is getting a lot steeper for us with these new architectures. They're becoming more complex. Um, and we see that with the hybrid systems that are becoming very prevalent in the leadership class systems in the U.S. Um, CP, predominantly CPU, GPU systems with two, two execution spaces, two memory spaces. Um, and, and our codes, by and large, in this country just aren't really ready for that. And we're trying to adapt. 
And, and I think we've got a lot of work to do to understand kind of the fundamental challenges of these new systems because they really are, um, I mean, it's, it's a game changing capability to have an exascale machine at your disposal and being able to use it wisely and, and get to the end question um, and, and answer that you're looking for, I think is really going to be one of the things that will pace us as we move towards that grand challenge. Can, can I push you a little bit more on that last point uh, that you were making? Uh, I think there's a concern among people like myself and others who are developing CFD codes for the future that, that we're spending or beginning to spend an inordinate amount of time programming for these next XSL machines. So do you have any pearls of wisdom as to what is in the horizon that may make our life a little bit simpler so we can focus on those challenges that we all articulated? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, so this is a this is a problem that we've been grappling with in DOE for for a while. Um, just knowing what the uh, the vendor roadmaps look like for um, new processor technology, um, yeah. and and just having the realization that we can't rewrite a uh, a CFD code that takes ten years to develop and and validate in two years time for the next vendor's uh, new architecture. Um, and the way that we've gone about trying to tackle this problem is through programming model abstractions. And, and there's evidence of this in a programming model that Sandia has developed called Cocos, um, which hides the underlying programming model and generally vendor specific programming model um, behind that abstraction. Um, and, and there are others out there. Obviously, we're most familiar with Cocos because we've developed it here at Sandia and we use it. But um, that is, I think, the, the, the winning formula for these very challenging new machine technologies and in the context of writing CFD codes. I mean, ultimately, we want to focus on our discretizations, our models, and, and we don't want to have to become um, subject matter experts in the programming model and the architecture. And I think that's how we do it. Um, I think there's a lot of great things out there in terms of frameworks for uh, being able to explore, explore things beyond uh, node level par parallel programming models like task-based parallelism. I, I think there's a lot of potential there. And I, I think um, that's those, those two things, um, you know, node level abstractions and task-based programming um, and really kind of galvanizing ourselves around those and not um, getting spread out too far, but really kind of wielding our collective knowledge is the way that we tackle that problem. Yeah, thank you, Micah. Yeah, I, I sure hope that's the case. Uh, we're yeah. eagerly expecting many of these frameworks to actually deliver in both performance and easiness of programming. So let, let, let's turn, if you guys don't mind, the conversation over to propulsion for a minute. Uh, Oma, you and I both lived through that DOE ASCII program that you referred to in your in your remarks from 1997 till 2008, where where we barely scratched the surface of full engine simulation. So the the flow physics and interdisciplinary coupling are very different in internal flows than than the the equivalent things in external flows. So I, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what do you think. Uh, will be the most important challenges to conquer or to reach that second grand challenge that you articulated. So, you know, full engine simulations in one week. Uh, do you have a, a top two favorite? I, I, I've been at it for a long time, not really. <laughs> so uh, do you mean to imply that we have to do all of them essentially in order to, to well, make headway? Well, I, full engine simulation, I think it's, again, you guys at uh, you know as, at Stanford University, we gave you a very tough problem in 1998, and uh, you guys produced outstanding results. Although you're saying you just scratch the surface, but in principle, you really put together tools which could analyze, which could, could simulate whole of the engine. You you did various fidelities, you did unsteady RAMs calculation with LDS you know, transferring information from RANS to LES and LES to RANS. And I think, unfortunately, you know, you didn't really have time to go and interrogate the data, look at the results what you are talking. In 2007, I came to United Technologies Research Center and uh, the program had just finished. So I kind of got the people you had trained, mm -hmm. we got them at research lab. So we looked at those results and I was shocked how good those results were. If we have, if we had gotten those results in time, you know, 
earlier, uh, I, we would have saved a lot of money in the engine development program. You know, that, that's kind of one thing. It's a pity that infrastructure you put together, people didn't pick it up and started inserting their own tools. I, I wish somebody does that. I mean, we have been kind of building it up since 2008, and we're making progress. Yeah. Uh, now, you, your question. Uh, I think technical challenges are a lot. You're right. Uh, interaction between airfoil rows, unsteady flows, multidisciplinary heat transfer, boundary conditions are very strange. Adiabatic wall boundary conditions don't work. Film cooling you know, is very complicated. Uh, but I think community is ready to resolve those. I, I don't think, I mean, there is nothing like we can't do it. It's just a question of engaging the community uh, between the you know, universities, research center, and the, uh, you know, and, and OEMs. Uh, this can be done. I think the biggest problem I see, as I see it, is really how would you get information from the uh, OEMs? Uh, mm -hmm. How would you really, you know, will they, will they agree to tell you whether your infrastructure is right, how good solutions they are getting? I think that's going to be an issue. And somehow people want to hold on to a lot of information when they don't really have to. I, I think what can help in this area is the, I mean, there are lots of demonstration program going on. I mean, Jimmy talked about, Jimmy Kenyon talked about a demo program he's going to do at NASA. Maybe the people who are running these programs should be asking, uh, you know, OEMs probably, how well can you predict these flows which you're going to demonstrate, you know? So I, I think interaction and getting the confidence of the OEM is the really biggest challenge. Uh, but so, again, return on I was going to ask you to elaborate on that a little bit, if you don't mind my interruption. Uh, you know, unlike in external aerodynamics where there've been a few or serious advancement experiments that NASA has sponsored, uh, uh, in order to benchmark the predictive capability of many of the codes, it, there haven't been such uh, experiments in the turbo machinery community. Uh, do you think these have a role to play? And, and is it a way to abstract away that which is not proprietary in order to enable the development of new capabilities? Yeah, I think, again, where I come from, I think tools are a lot more reliable than we think they are. We worry about you know, is the code validated? Equations are right. Only problem with the predictions is really, are we modeling the features? Is the physics right, really? I mean, otherwise, and are the boundary conditions right? So calculations are truth within that domain. Uh, we don't know transition, so predicting transition becomes a problem. And I think NASA has been doing some certain uh, basic experiments like we yep. did a boundary layer injecting fan. And I think yep. they're setting up some experiments like compressor and turbine. Doing uh, experiments for coal engine is going to be very hard, but mm -hmm. controlled experiments where you ask specific questions and answer that question. You know, I think that, that's how we are going to make progress. But I have confidence it can be done. I mean, today we can do calculations which are not that bad. But eliminating the redesigns is the kind of problem. How do you get it right? Not first time, but at least minimize the number of design iterations. Uh, I think it's within yep. reach. The community has to work together. And I think the agencies have a big role to play here. I, I think, you know, yep. funding agencies, they need to be asking for rigor, really. Mm -hmm. We'll get back to that. In fact, I have a question yeah. for John about this, and there's been a question in the audience uh, related to this topic. So th thanks, uh, um, Oma. I, I, I want to switch to space a little bit, if you guys don't mind, so we can engage all of the panelists. So, so Ray, uh, uh, you're up next. Uh, uh, in, in the Vision 2030 CFD study, we included uh, a precursor to the grand challenges. These were called cases that were little insets that we had put uh, in the actual report to just kind of show the kinds of things that we might be able to do. And there was one called case study number four, uh, title quote, the impact of CFD tool development of NASA science and space exploration missions. So and that was six years of, of perspective. 
how has your thinking changed in relation to the key elements uh, for CFE that can help you achieve your grand challenge number four? I, I'm really curious if there's been a, a, any change from back then or, or new things that have come up or, or, or we really got it right at the beginning with your help uh, since you were quoted in that report. Well, you know, I, things have changed and they've changed in several different interesting ways. One of them is flight data. So we started getting flight data on these capsules. And we're finding out that some of our, despite our best efforts, uh, extensive wind tunnel test campaigns, lots of CFD, we're still missing some of these things. You know, there are still challenges out there. Even with our best tools and our best techniques, we're still missing some of the, the tough problems. So I think that we've gotten a little bit of a um, reality check. And that's, the, that's why, you know, flight data is so important because there's uh, interesting phenomena out there. When you move coming from space shuttle to, uh, to capsules and the abort systems we're dealing with now has been quite a transition. And the last six years have brought that into, uh, you know, highlighted uh, a lot of the areas where we've got some challenges. Um, there are a lot of things I see developing through 2030 that are very encouraging. You know, I think we're starting to get a handle on discretization. Uh, adaptation is starting to take a hold, and we're bringing geometry along with us. And discretization error is not going to be a leading term for our error uh, anymore. Um, I know Philippe Spillard has mentioned that before. Unfortunately, that's going to highlight our physical modeling issues with turbulence modeling and transition. And uh, those are areas we're working very hard. You know, we're continuing to look at new models and new developments to try and improve these. So we know our problem areas are on the vehicles we're seeing now. But as we move to new vehicles, new types of vehicles, I'm sure we'll uncover new limitations we'll have to address. Yeah, so I'm glad you're seeing the end uh, of uh, numerical discretization errors. Uh, I, I've been waiting for this for a long time. So thanks for saying that. So. Well, I, I can see the the light at the end of that tunnel. <laughs> I'm not sure we're there, <laughs> but I think we're getting Absolutely. close. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Uh, John, uh, since uh, you mentioned this, and there's a question from the audience on this topic, I, I, I wanted to say that uh, you know we should thank NASA because you played a key role in organizing the community around the Vision 2030 CFD report, and and, and you've been tremendously effective at that task. Uh, but but how do you think the various programs at NASA that you oversee and some of the others can be most effective to continue to support the improvements in both our simulation and HPC capabilities? So we have a fighting chance of completing these grand challenges. Yeah. And, and you talked yeah. about synergies, which I think the question there uh, also put out there. So. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I appreciate the, the recognition, uh, but frankly, if NASA isn't providing value in terms of the way we, uh, we conduct these studies, the way we try to bring the university and the community together, um, we aren't going to be effective. I mean, it, it relies on you putting the, the trust in us that when we do something, it, it has that, that value uh, and you get something out of it. Um, but, you know, again, consistent with some of the last comments we were hearing from, from Ohm, um, it, the, uh, the, the great challenge in trying to develop uh, the, these databases around non-competitive, non-proprietary configurations that have value in terms of of establishing a, a data set that can be used to validate these codes. So I think on, on the external flow side, on the aero side, I think we've, we've got some opportunities. A lot of these common research models that we're looking to develop, you know, and with the community, not just ours, right, uh, and share them, I think is, is a great way that we can continue to be part of that. Um, but one of the other things that uh, I think it was Micah that was bringing up, uh, the, the, the challenges around the computational capabilities that are required in order to be able to bring these uh, these larger high fidelity simulations, these full full vehicles, full system evaluation, are going to require uh, I mean, substantial, I'll say, government investment in order to make sure that these things can be brought to the broader community for efficiency and and for value. Uh, we struggle, I mean, as Michael was saying as well, with getting access to some of these new architectures or these these massively parallel machines in order to, to validate our, our work. We are constantly trying to find enough resources to do two things, be able to invest in the production hardware that will allow us to, um, uh, to just get our, our daily business done and, and get some advancements, uh, but also trying to 
port some of our existing codes into these uh, these new configurations to allow us to take advantage of some of the physics that we've spent time developing and, and coding uh, and and show value uh, you know for the for the community. So uh, you know models and data are great. Uh, having the physics-based models in order to evaluate uh, the, uh, these these capabilities, but then you know dealing with the the real world of what are the machines that we're going to be driving these on. We conduct routinely um, evaluations and assessment of the high computing environment. They're trying to, I mean, much like Michael was describing as well. How do we know what is coming down the, the pike? How do we uh, adapt our procurements in order to make sure that we're bringing in those, those architectures that we can actually get it, take advantage of you know, in a time frame that is meaningful? Um, but, but all those things are, are very similar. I think we can be a part of that solution with our colleagues in DOD, with industry to try to understand what some of these non proprietary configurations are that we may be able to model for a common research approach for data. But it's going to be on, on that kind of a level, the fact that we have these grand challenges, we have this community come together on the 2030 vision document is, is great, but we really need to bring ourselves together around some of these these real needs and, and, and do it together. It's just too great. I, I can't agree more. Thank you, John. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time. We have another eight minutes left uh, in the session. So I, I'd like to open it up to to the panel to to do quick answers, possibly, and some of the following questions. Uh, I, uh, I often think about these grand challenges as something that, that really rallies up the troops to, to do something in a concerted fashion. But what keeps you guys up at night in terms of not being able to achieve these challenges? Does anybody want to go first? Yeah. Well, one, I've got a kind of a, yeah. a quick one. So one of the questions yeah. I get asked often is people say, well, we went to the moon without high-end computers. Why do we need them now? Yeah. And so, you know, what's happened is we've lost a lot of our, um, our testing capabilities. And so we've had to replace that. And we've got imperfect tools. We've got mm -hmm. wind tunnels, which can't get the scale and propulsion effects we need. So the primary tool we have before we do a full flight test is this computational capability. And yeah. so the thing that gets me is, is when, uh, you know, we've um, not been able to test something and how we've got these uh, CFD tools, which haven't been able to, to uh, give us a, a, a reliable answer. And then we got a piece of hardware we're about to fly. So those are the sorts of things that we think about. So, so getting the validation keeps you up at night. Uh Sorry, if I may interrupt, what keeps you up at night in terms of having to rely exclusively on computations and having to deliver the capabilities that are even more sophisticated than those of the Apollo years? So are our uncertainties appropriate? Yeah. Right? You know, what we end up doing is trying to be conservative, and we hope that we're conservative. We do the best we can, but that'll keep you up at night, not knowing if your uncertainties are, are realistic. Yeah. Which How about anybody else? Risk issues, right? I mean, how do we manage that risk? Uh, it, you know, one of the, uh, the comment about uh, that um, Ray just brought up of going to the moon back in the Apollo days. Uh, our, you know, the engineers that I worked with early in my career would tell me we went to we went to the moon on just a few data points. Uh, we were willing to take certain kind of risks, but we did have the facilities in order to get those few data points. And listening to Jim Bridenstine this morning, we also had a budget that's substantially larger than what we have right now. Uh, so how do we make this, how do we do this much more smartly uh, in the context of, um, of the size of the challenges? Computation is going to be a huge part of that. Um, and, mm -hmm. and making sure that we've got the workforce that is going to be able to uh, take advantage of the, these new needs, these new capabilities, and bring new innovation to the way in which we're dealing with our computation capability. I mean, a lot of that you know, speaks to our, um, our, our universities and just how they are developing this workforce that's going to be so critical to meeting all these challenges in the future. That, that's part sure. of what keeps me away from that. Thank you, John. Uh, Micah, Steve, or uh, Ohm, any comments on that? Yeah, yeah. I think two things. One, computers have already been identified computers. My biggest worry, one of my biggest worries is really, would we be able to keep the people in the, in the area? I think IT and stock market is really taking a lot of capital away from, from this area. So we need to keep on 
keep it kind of a, keep people engaged. And universities are also turning away from classical, you know, CFD. So, you know, make, make sure we are keeping talents coming through. Sure. And uh, that's it. Steve. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Steve? Yeah, um, you know, I actually am highly confident we can get there, but we just have, have to have the resolve to go do it. And if I have to say, you know, what's what's my concern is, are we going to be able to, because I talked about this, all, every one of these had to be done in a very broad-based community, right? And so yeah. do, does our community as a whole have the resolve to stick to it and achieve what we need to achieve? I, I think we can do it. We've just got to have that resolve. So, Steve, there's there's a matter of, uh, you know, this being an AIAA technical or integration committee putting these things together. How, how do we continue to rally up the troops? And I, I think there is need for leadership in ensuring that all of these efforts do come together to realize these capabilities. Um, do you think we put it on NASA in order to be able to lead this whole thing? Is that uh, the best way to go? Well, you know, again, because it's a broad-based community, I don't think that any one entity should be responsible for every aspect of it. I think you're going to have yeah. many leaders that will make this happen. Interesting. Mike, I don't know if you want to, uh, to tell us about what, what's keeping you up awake uh, in hypersonics. So I think um, Steve mentioned resolve, and, and I think there's a lot of resolve in the hypersonics space right now. Uh, we see it across government and we see it within NASA. And, and as we talk about CFD 2030 and, and the vision here and where we want to go with these grand challenge problems, um, one thing that's very evident to me is that we're pushing to the high end high end in terms of, of the machines that these will run on, the codes that they will be used, the models that, that we will be developing and using. And the thing that worries me and keeps me up at night is, can we use this, these high end capabilities across the board to actually make an impact at the bottom line? And will that, will that make a difference to the, you know, the engineers that are out there that are developing these systems? Or have we gotten so exquisite that we're just going to just kind of miss the boat. And that's, that's oh, what sure. we're doing, is just making sure that we, if, you know, we've got this, um, this really exquisite capability that we can really use it to improve the bottom line in terms of hypersonic technology development. That's an excellent point. I, I think we have time for maybe one more quick question. Uh, I'm picking this from the audience and um, it, it is something we did not talk much about in the original report. And this is this idea that both AI and machine learning techniques are really coming to play in the CFD domain and in the physical sciences. I, I wonder if anybody has something to say about a prognostication of how much these techniques will be useful in the grand challenges that we just described today. Does anybody want to jump in into that one? I can take a start at that. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Since you have the floor. So I, I, I feel like we're now in the in the aerospace community and in the CFD world, just starting to kind of understand the potential of AI and ML. Um, I, I, it's you know we see the uh, the power of it in um, kind of distant areas, you know, very very far far removed from aerospace engineering. And I think we're just now starting to realize really what it can do for us. And I don't think we fully understand that yet. Um, yeah. and, and the way, so the areas where I've seen this really start to be applied is, is at least one area that I can think of is in the context of, of turbulence modeling and, and using machine learning to improve our, our RANS turbulence yeah. models. I think that's a great area. I, I don't think it's the, the only area. I think there's just so much more that we can explore. And similar to talking about how, you know, we need a blending of subject matter expertise between aerospace engineer and computer scientist. We also need a, at least a better understanding between aerospace engineer and AI and machine learning practitioner so that we can really understand the technology and use it to our benefit. And I think some, some areas outside of the, um, the, the vision study where this could have an impact is, is in, in things that are you know, aerospace, aerospace application areas like guidance navigation control. And I think there's just a lot that we can use to help us understand the data that's coming our way. So we talked about there's kind of a lack of flight test data. There's a wealth of computational data. How do we sift through it? How do we make sense of it? How do we make decisions? And I think that's where we can have an impact. Yeah. 
No, thank you, Mike. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I, I have to tell you that I, I have a vague recollection in one of the Vision 2030 CFD workshops uh, uh, discussing the possibility of this, but not spending very much time on it. And it's come, and there may be many uses, maybe not directly in the solvers, but in, in other places. So, so I'm afraid that we've come to the end of the session. Uh, we are running out of time. So I really would like to thank a number of people, particularly the panelists who put a lot of effort into their remarks and into sharing their time with us uh, to answer questions from the audience. Uh, so thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, but also the AAA uh, Integration Committee for the Vision 2030 CFD, who has been leading the effort to put these four grand challenges together. And I'll be remiss if I don't highlight Mujib Malik from NASA and Jeff Slotnick from Boeing, who have been sort of behind the production of all these different things. So. So with that, uh, we're going to conclude the session. Thank you all again. Uh, please stay well, stay safe, and stay healthy. And we hope to see you again in a forum in person in the next chance we have. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.